This video is about bivalve mollusks, like this beautiful file shell, Limeria hemphili. Bivalves are part of a clade of mollusks that bear one or two shells. The sister to that large clade is the Aplicophora polyplicophora clade. One familiar bivalve in Southern California is the mussel Middleus californianus, which often lives in wave-exposed habitats like the pilings of the Seal Beach Pier. These mussels attach firmly to hard surfaces using protein threads called bissel threads. Easier for me to collect was the non-native mussel Middleus galloprovincialis from wave-protected habitats like Alamitos Bay Marina. Here are two very small mussels from Alamitos Bay. The one on the right is also non-native. I collected it by accident in a clump of Middleus. The Archaeotula has lots of bissel threads other mussels made attached to its shell. Both mussels are using their feet to move around. Here's a larger middleus with its own bissel threads coming out from the two shell valves ventrally. It also has a few bissel threads made by some other muscle attached to its shell. You can see where they attach is flat. That part is called the plaque. Here I've removed the right valve from that same individual. The white tissue is the mantle on the right side of the body. It's white because it contains testes. This individual was a male. Under the mantle, you can see the right tenidium in the mantle cavity. Here I've cut off that mantle tissue so we can see the tenidium more clearly. It looks like there are two tenidia on the right, but those are just the outer and inner demibranks of one tenidium. If you lift up both demibranks, you can see where that mass of bissel threads is attached to the body, as well as the foot. Here's a little better view of the foot. You can see it has a groove running down one surface. That is the groove in which it secretes each bissel thread one by one. At the anterior end of the tenidium, there are two big flaps called labial palps. You can see those a little better in higher magnification. These two are the palps of the right tenidium. There are two more on the other side for the left tenidium.
between those pairs of labial palps is the mouth. My forceps are now in the mouth of this muscle. Cilia on the tinidium pump water across the tinidium from ventral to dorsal, and particles caught on the upstream surface of the tinidium can be caught and carried down to the ventral edge of each demibrank. Here I'm adding red particles to the water. Some of these are caught on the tinidium and carried down to that ventral edge of this outer demibrank. You can see that some of them are moving to the left on that ventral edge. They're being carried to the palps for sorting. Here's more transport of particles on the tinidium on a different individual. Large particles often just get carried to the edge of the tinidium where they stop, but smaller ones move between the filaments into a groove that you can barely see where they are carried rapidly towards the palps. Here's what the ventral edge of the tinidium looks like at higher magnification. Each vertical line is a filament or leaf of the bipectinate tinidium. The stair step pattern on the surface of the tinidium is made up of ciliary connections between adjacent filaments. This stabilizes the form of the tinidium. Here you can see those ciliary connections between filaments at higher magnification. To see what these cilia do at the level of the whole animal, we can look into the mantle cavity of an individual that is happily feeding from the ventral surface. I've mounted this one in clay so we can see the ventral edges of the tinidia. Captured particles should be carried anteriorly towards the right in this individual on the ventral edges of the tinidia. The pale yellowish tissue to the right is the foot. If you look at the edge of the shell, you can also see the middle lobe of the mantle edge sticking out a little bit. Here you can see the ventral edges of the inner demibranks of both right on top and left on the bottom tinidia. And if I add red particles, you can see them carried towards the palps at the anterior end. Here I've reoriented the animal a bit so we can see the edges of both demibranks of the right tinidium. 
The same thing is happening on both tinidia. Particles are being passed towards the palps where they will be sorted and either rejected or passed to the mouth for ingestion. At a whole organism scale, the beating of those tenidial cilia leads to a well-defined mantle cavity flow pattern in posteriorly and ventrally and out posteriorly and dorsally. To see how effective this is in suspension feeding, I put these 10 middleists in one liter of water to which I added lots of green algal cells. I also had a beaker without mussels, but with the same amount of algae for comparison. Both were stirred to keep the algae in suspension. I've sped up the next 20 minutes of footage, and if you watch that, you can see that after 20 minutes, the water was much more clear. The mussels caught and ate all of those tiny cells. Here they are enjoying life in their little food jacuzzi. You can see that even these fairly large individuals can extend their feet and use them to move around. One more thing that's easy to see in a muscle is its heart. Here's one oriented so we're looking at its dorsal surface. The heart is normally in the pericardium, but here I've torn the pericardium open, so we're looking directly at the ventricle, that central whitish tube, and the two auricles, the brown frilly tissue above and below, that is to the muscles left and right of the ventricle. In this anesthetized specimen, the ventricle only contracts when I give it a mechanical stimulus. You can see where the auricles are attached to the ventricle when you pull on each of them. Here's an empty valve of a middleus. You can see the iridescent nacreous shell layer on the inside. The ligament protein is dorsal towards the anterior of the shell.
The other interesting thing you can see on the growing edge of the shell is the first shell layer to be deposited, the periostracum. It's this thin, flexible, greenish-brown layer. Let's look at some bivalve diversity. Here's Donax gouldi. This individual is carrying a hydroid colony. Donax normally lives in sandy beaches where it is sometimes tossed around in the surf. I'm mimicking that by shaking the dish. You can see that this clam tries to dig actively as soon as I stop shaking. Presumably it does that as soon as it settles on the bottom after being tossed around in a wave as well. This is a clam with siphons, which are coming out of the posterior end of the shell. The ventral siphon is inhalant, the dorsal one is exhalant. They look quite different from each other. Here's a better view of the siphons. The inhalant siphon is the one on the left here, that's posterior ventral. The flow pattern is basically the same as in a muscle, in posteriorly and ventrally, this time through that inhalant siphon, and out posteriorly and dorsally, out the exhalant siphon. Internally, the organization is similar to the muscle. The foot is the large white structure pointed to the left. Here are the palps of the left tinidium. The tinidium is relatively small, and it looks like the outer demibranch is smaller than the inner demibranch. Again, here's a better look at the two siphons. Lysaea is a very small clam. These are adults, and that is a millimeter scale on the left. They're parthenogenetic. These are all females and will produce fertilized eggs on their own without mating. These are from empty barnacle shells from a pier in Alamitos Bay. Lysaea is a little weird because it has only one siphon, which is inhalant. It's also weird because the siphon sticks out anteriorly. Usually siphons extend from the posterior. These clams were a little too small for me to demonstrate flow on, but I'm assuming that exhalant flow comes out posteriorly and dorsally, as is normal for bivalves.
Here's the shell of a purple hinge rock scallop, Crassodoma gigantea. And here's a living individual. Once the shell is open, you can see eyes on the middle lobe of the mantle. The orange sheet of tissue below that on the top valve, which is the left valve, is the inner lobe of the mantle. You can see the ventral edges of two tinnidial demibranchs. Those edges are very brown. This is an amazing Southern California clam, the file shell Limeria hemphili. File shells have very thin shells, and you can see the heart beating through the shell in this individual. This individual is moving by clapping the valves together to swim kind of ineffectively. Those crazy tentacles are extensions of the mantle, I'm assuming from the middle lobe. The clam can autotomize those, and autotomized tentacles become very sticky. Here's an isolated tentacle. You can see that it's muscular.
I'm guessing that the stickiness is due to secretions from these gland cells that contain large vesicles. This is a shipworm, a bivalve that causes damage to wooden structures in the ocean. They burrow into wood. This one has been dissected out of its burrow. The shell is the tiny object on the left. The vast majority of the body does not fit into the shell. At the right end, there are two siphons, inhalant and exhalant, and a structure that looks vaguely like a pine cone. That is the palate, which is used as an operculum to block the burrow opening. The shell has ridges on it, and it's used as a file to mechanically enlarge the burrow as the clam grows. Here's a piece of wood riddled with shipworm burrows. The shipworms line each burrow with a thin layer of calcium carbonate. Okay, let's end by looking at some bivalve shells to see diversity in overall shape, in the form of the ligament, and in whether or not there are interlocking teeth in the hinge area. Here's that recently dead Crassodoma gigantea again. If the animal were alive, it would close the shell using adductor muscles, but then the shell springs open on its own when those muscles are relaxed. The shell springs open because when the shell is closed, energy is stored in this little brown lump of protein, the ligament. The ligament is very elastic, it's like a little rubber ball. That's true only when it's fresh. Once it dries out, it becomes very stiff and inflexible. This scallop also has a very obvious ligament. In this case, it's dry and no longer elastic. This is a pen shell which normally lives buried in the sediment with just the wide end on the right sticking out. The ligament in this shell is more like that in Middleus, just a thin brown line here. This is a gaper clam. The two valves don't seal shut. This clam had large siphons that could be extended out of that opening on the posterior end. They were so large that they couldn't be pulled back into the shell.
This clam has a nice tooth on the hinge on one valve, and there's a corresponding hole in the other valve that that tooth fits in. These blood clams have interlocking undulations on the edge of the shell. They also have amazing interlocking teeth at the hinge, which you can see by separating these two valves. Spondylus makes this amazing shell sculpture. If you look inside the shell, you can see a much simpler system of interlocking hinge teeth. And finally, one valve of a giant clam. This valve is very heavy. It's amazing to think that an animal biomineralized all this material over just a few years or decades.